The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. Welcome to On the Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum, along with a man whose insight on wrestling is always on track. That's Andy Hamilton of TrackWrestling.com. Welcome, Andy, to our beautiful studio inside of your office. It's a pretty cool setup. It is a pretty cool setup. I hope people will come by and see it if you're in the area. I don't. I know Waterloo isn't necessarily... In the crosshairs of where people are traveling to. But if you do come to the Gable Museum, I hope you'll stop by. And maybe if you're a big enough name, we'll interview you. Yeah. We'll bring you into the office, into the studio here. Maybe give you a water if you got yeah. one in the fridge. <laughs> Who knows? That would be cool. We had Barry Davis on a podcast. He came by. I thought that was a great interview. I think you had someone say that they didn't want it to end. Uh, can't remember We had exactly, a couple but, people that said that sure. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Barry Davis, you know, we said this before, um, probably the first favorite wrestler I had Mm -hmm. growing up, you know, just, you know, me being a little guy, Barry Davis being a little guy, you know, he was so much fun to watch uh, back when he was winning titles with the Hawkeyes, scoring a lot of points. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Hopefully we get, uh, hopefully we're able to get more people stopping through, you know, hopefully see a lot more names going up on that national championship, Matt. Across the wall, yeah, in the Gable Training Center. Well, we have a great show here, in that the World Cup is coming up before we're doing this podcast. It's coming up in a couple of days. But we had a great chance to sit down with Bill Zadick, the national team coach for freestyle, Jordan Burroughs, five-time World and Olympic champion, and David Taylor, four-time All-American, four-time finalist, two-time NCAA champion, two-time U.S. Open champion, and a guy that I think is going to be a world champion at some point, maybe an Olympic champion. We had a chance to talk to all three of those guys. So if you're listening to this podcast in its entirety, make sure you listen all the way through. It's three interviews. I thought all of them were just rock solid solid gold. I thought they had some great insight. So we were really fortunate to be down at Carver Hawkeye Arena for two of those. David Taylor called in for one, but just to have really high level athletes and coaches on the show is really a lot of fun for us to pick their brain and get great insight. Yeah. Typically we try to make this like what a 50 minute to an hour long show. Yeah. We're going to go long today, but uh, it's not going to feel like 50 minutes to an hour. It's going to you know go by in a blink of an eye just because, you know, time gets away from us sometimes when conversations like this are, uh, you know, when, when they're given a solid gold for responses and, I always say that the uh, best interviews aren't interviews, they're conversations. We had three conversations Mm -hmm. with these guys and, uh, you know, it's, it's great stuff and thoroughly enjoyed the time that each of us, each of them gave us. And what'd you tell Jordan Burroughs? We waited around for a while to, to get Jordan Burroughs. I think you said five to 10 minutes and you're (laughs) out and then being 25 minutes. I know. I feel bad about that. It, uh. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's never five to ten, right? No. I mean, it's... How it, could you? And, and the thing is with Jordan, like, I've even stopped going into interviews with, like, a list of questions in mind. And, you know, you just go in and it turns into a conversation and he says something that, you know, triggers something in your mind and then that leads you in a different direction. I mean, one of the things that I thought about, you know, and we'll get into in the interview with Jordan, it's great stuff about how... First time I interviewed him was in 2008 after he finished third at the NCAA championships and uh, asked him uh, about, about the weight class then. And, and he was really shy and quiet and, and nothing like the guy he is now. And, and I asked him, I said, what, what happened? You know, what changed you into the, you know, media friendly, outgoing, gregarious, charismatic guy that you are now. And, and uh, his response to that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly well worth listening to all of the interviews. So make sure you stick around. Bill Zadick, Jordan Burroughs, David Taylor are all on this great episode and this great edition of On the Mat. As we look forward to the World Cup, this is unique in that it's a Carver Hawkeye arena. Not that wrestling is unique at Carver, but you've been to more wrestling meets and covered more than anyone in the last 20 years 
when you think about Carver Hawkeye, you have the, of course, the Iowa Hawkeyes competing there. We've had the Olympic trials there. We've had some select dual meets there, international dual meets, all-star meets, conflict at Carver, a slew of things. But this is unique. How do you feel going into this? Because I have a certain vibe and a certain way that I think this is going to play out. But there's just a different feel, different anticipation than any other wrestling event that we've had before. I'm really excited about it. One, I mean... It's it's a loaded United States team, right? I mean, you take the team that won the world title last year, you throw in uh, David Taylor and Kyle Dake, uh, guys that uh, are going to be in the mix for world titles this year at at uh, seventy nine and ninety uh, seventy nine and eighty six. But you you know you got Jaden Cox going from eighty six up to ninety two, and so strengthen that United States lineup. Lots of guys that are fun to watch. Freestyle wrestling is crazy entertaining right now. Um, I think fans are going to be treated to one heck of a show down there. It's a shame that uh, Iran and, and Russia are not in this. Um, that would have heightened things, I think, you know, to an even higher level. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think um, when you add India and Mongolia, you add two more top flight 57 kilo guys that uh, Thomas Gilman could potentially run into, um, you know, it, you know, the way it plays out, he's gonna, he's gonna face, uh, Amit Kumar from India. Um, he's going to get, uh, uh, Yuki Takahashi in a rematch of the world final. Um, you know, he's going to get a guy from Georgia that's pretty doggone good. And then, uh, if, if the United States wins all three, uh, it'd be interesting, you know, you know, probably Azerbaijan coming through on the other side, uh, but uh, I'm I'm super excited about what we're going to see. I, I mean, just a chance to watch all of the top wrestlers in the United States in one spot. Right. And in competing not against each other, but with each other, with a chance to uh, bring home a World Cup title for the United States. It's going to be a lot of fun. Kind of has that Ryder Cup feel for golf. Yeah. In a way that, hey, we're all in this together and you just get a chance to enjoy competition. And even just talking about Jordan Burroughs in the interview, hey, he wrestled against Kyle Dake and David Taylor. Those guys were competitors at 163 and then they moved up and now they're all on a World Cup team. That's really cool to see. And I, I hope people embrace that part of it, that this is international competition at its best. And not a lot of people get to go to the World Championships. This is a, a great opportunity to see the entire United States team that won the World Championships. It's going to be there in its entirety for the most part. A few changes here and there. We get to see them all wrestle all in sequential order. That's unprecedented. We have a, a unique opportunity to see this the year after they won it. Hope people really embrace that. Yeah, I mean, we talked to Tom Brands yesterday. I don't know if you were standing there. I think you probably were when, when we were talking to him about, about just the lineup. I mean, you got Gilman, world silver medalist, Steber, four time NCAA champion. Burroughs, five-time World and Olympic champion. Dake, four-time NCAA champion. Taylor, four-time NCAA finalist, two-time NCAA champ, two-time Hodge winner, uh, rolled through the World Cup, won the Oregon. Uh, Jaden Cox, uh, two-time World and Olympic bronze medalist. Kyle Snyder, maybe um, on track to having the best career of any American ever. Uh, Nick Wisdowski, um, World bronze medalist. You know, I didn't mention Kendrick Maple in there, but uh, James I, Green. Yeah, James yeah. Green, world silver medalist. Um, Kendrick Maple, I think a guy with a lot of upside as well. You know, NCAA champion. So, uh, man, it's it's a pretty stacked lineup. So you said something interesting. I like this about the product that freestyle wrestling has right now. Because if we go back to 2012 when the Olympic trials were here, I think we were at the low point in yeah. international wrestling. That's horrible. And I think both of us would agree that the only reason we were covering it is because we felt like we had to. It wasn't a good product. It wasn't enjoyable. The leg clinch, the the ball pull, it was just, it was really bad. Now we get the upside. We get to see a great international product. As we look back to the world team trials last year in Lincoln, Nebraska, was that the best wrestling that you've ever seen? I think it might be the best wrestling I've ever seen, the most entertainment value I've ever been a part of. You've been to a few more international events than I have in the last year or so. But for me personally, I don't think I've ever enjoyed wrestling more 
than last year at Lincoln. That was awesome. I've been spoiled though, man. Yeah, you have been. I, it's like, awesome. It's great. You have been. I I sat there in Paris on the twenty sixth of August, thinking, will it ever get any better than this? You know, will I ever see anything like this? You know, even States. higher than the Lincoln. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just because, I mean, you know, the tournament comes down like the world title comes down to Snyder Sajalayev mm-hmm. in the final 20 seconds, right? Like so much riding on that, so much anticipation for that match. And it, it comes down to that. And and then to be in the tunnel watching Sajalayev come off the mat like 10 feet in front of Kyle Snyder and the contrast in emotions there. You know, you got one guy coming off totally dejected and all the Russian coaches walking alongside him and behind that is, you know, a red, white, and blue party. <laughs> and, you know, it went on, you know, for probably 15, 20 minutes. Like, you know, just the just the joy on the faces of the people, you know, connected with USA Wrestling and that men's freestyle team. It it was something that I'm I'm never gonna forget. And I and uh I don't know how many people at home got the chance to see that that celebration. I, I captured it on video and we put it up on track wrestling. It's it's out there somewhere still, but uh um you know that's that's a picture in my mind that that I'll replay for decades. And uh Paris was unbelievable. I mean it it was unbelievable. Not just Snyder Sajalayev, but uh you know I think about that heavyweight match with uh Taha Akgul uh getting knocked off by Gino Petrishvili, I think a 10-9 match. Oh yeah. And and yeah. maybe the best heavyweight match I've ever seen. And I've heard other people say that too. Um, Frank Chimizo putting on such a show uh, at 70 kilos, um, you know, up and down. I mean, the Haji Ali of a guy that'll be in Iowa city this weekend, wins his third world title at 61. He'll be there at 65 for Azerbaijan. Um, Wasn't Burroughs down in every match. Is that, I think he was, I think he was, I think he had to come from behind in each, each match. And, uh, you know, being there, seeing him win his fifth world title yeah. coming back. I mean, we, we got a chance to talk to him about that. Uh, asked him, you know, do any of the world titles have more meaning than the other? And he talked about that, yeah. you know, having to climb back up and all the doubt that he faced and overcoming it, getting back up and winning another world title on the climb. I thought that was pretty cool as Where's, well. So where will this fit in? Do you think you've seen the world team trials, world championships, international events, where do you think this fits in on what the excitement scale is going to be and just having one of those memorable wrestling experiences? I don't know. I'm curious. Yeah, me too. That's I'm really that's curious. I don't know. It's just, it's fascinating to think about it. As you said, the Iranians and the Russians aren't here, but I just think there's so much that we get to be excited about with this, that you get to see these guys one more time in a pretty big environment. And I think that's what separates this from other competitions is that, you look up and down the lineup, just all the guys you mentioned, we get to see him this weekend. Yeah. That's not to mention the, the Kyvan Gadsons who might slip in. And, and he was born in Iowa City from Iowa. I hope he gets a match in there somewhere. But Cuba? Yeah. Cuba's bringing a squad. Holy They're, smokes. Like four, I think four world medalists. Uh, Yolis Bon Rodriguez, who, if, if you haven't watched him wrestle, don't turn away. Uh, because he's one of the most electrifying wrestlers on the planet. And he does some stuff that, uh, man, you you sit there and you watch it, and, and uh, it's it's incredible. It's the, the the kind of stuff he does. It's it, you know, no lead is safe, and and uh, he has a position to score five points at any second, and you get a five in freestyle, man. Those are <laughs> those are hard to come by, but uh, you know, those he, he fills up highlight reels. Uh, there's a match in in uh, the Oregon this year where where he got uh in on a shot lifted a guy up carried him across the mat and basically did a cartwheel on top of this guy spiked him and um you know he does stuff like that all the time and uh so there yeah we're gonna be treated we're gonna be treated to what uh Takahashi world champion uh Burroughs five-time World Olympic champion Snyder, three-time World Olympic champion Haji Aliyev, three-time World champion. Um, numerous other guys in there that have been world medalists as well. So, you know, it's it's not uh, the all of the best of the best, but it's a lot of the best of the best. 
make sure you let people know how they can watch. Yeah, it's going to be we streamed live on Track Wrestling. We have a couple options where you can buy the World Cup, uh, just just this event, or you can buy the UWW Season Pass, which gets you uh, the World Cup, all of uh, the Continental qual- uh, the Continental Championships. Um, it will have all the World Championships, uh, Cadet, Junior, U23, Senior Level. Uh, so there's there's a lot of value in that season pass. There's going to be plenty of wrestling for you to watch, not just live, but on demand as well. So if you don't want to stay up um, three, four in the morning to watch uh, the European championships, uh, but you want to go back and watch all the matches and all the high level stuff that will be uh, taking place at the Euro championships this year, you can certainly uh, go back and watch all of it on demand. One of the craziest things that, I saw a track has, and I, I need to buy it. You can watch every match from the NCAA championships. Yep. That is crazy to me to think back that in the 90s, they had these VHS tapes, and you had to plug it in. I tried to find some matches from like 95 NCAA championships and could barely find it, and it's all scattered around. And here you have every single match on demand. What a great privilege that is. I know. We're so but, lucky right I mean, now. I don't think I don't think the young people like growing up now realize how good they have it oh. as far as that goes. Remember like when we were growing up, Kyle, when you, know, you wanted to watch an NCAA championship match? If you weren't there, if you didn't go to the NCAA championships, it was like two or three weeks later. On wide wide world of sports, right? Yeah, and you might get you might get the third period of a match, a like package, and, and yeah. of a match or, or two or three. It wasn't like every second of every match <laughs> in the finals. It was maybe you know you might have saw fifteen fifteen minutes of wrestling total, right? If yeah, that. yeah, it was just a highlight package. It was, it's unreal. I and I hope people really appreciate that to have an on demand and to be able to go back and watch every single match. And you don't have to worry about a DVD player. You don't have to worry about VHS tape or getting ruined. It's all there. It's all online. What a, what a great resource to have. Yeah. Hope people appreciate it. Hey, I hope people appreciate what's coming up next. We're going to have three outstanding, outstanding interviews. Bill Zadick, the national team coach for freestyle will be up first. Followed by Jordan Burroughs, followed by David Taylor. Stick around. We have those interviews coming up next. We are with Bill Zadick, head wrestling coach for USA Wrestling, the national team coach, world champion in 2006, NCAA champion in 1996. And what I like is that we're doing this interview where you won your NCAA championship. You won it for the University of Iowa. We're in the bowels of Carver Hawk Arena, just a few feet away from where you made your mark and competed a lot is that fun to come back here and really know that this was a a place that built you into where you are today yeah it's it's uh it's enjoyable to come back you know i have a lot of fond memories and um i learned a lot matured a lot um and so uh It's exciting to be back here. Your path to get to this job is unique in that you're from Montana. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, you took a a journey even growing up where you went to all of the events across the country. How did that factor into your success in building you into where you are today? Um, Yeah, uh, you know, growing up in Montana, we we had lost our Division I programs uh, when I was a young kid. And I had followed them, you know, when they were active. And... uh, but because we lost them so early, we didn't have a lot of access to next level information. You know, it wasn't, we weren't in the communication age. You know, I was waiting for, you know, USA Wrestling News to come out and, and uh, those kind of periodicals uh, to get to get the latest on what was happening. And so um, we had to work really hard. We had to travel. We had to go out and find coaching and training camps and better competitions uh, to get new and better information. So, Bill, as you look at uh, all the opportunities that you, know, you talk about your high school development and, and coming up the, the age division ranks, but uh, kids now have so many more opportunities with whether it be video and in the study of you know technique and, and also opportunities to get into college rooms and roll around with high level guys. Not just college rooms, but Olympic hopefuls, world hopefuls. You ever think about what? That would have done for your career. You ever a little bit jealous of what the guys have now these days? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I don't know. I've never really been jealous of it. Uh, I do think it's awesome opportunity for young guys. Um, I know that uh, 
we worked really hard with what we had, and I don't know that we could could have done a whole lot more um, with the opportunities that we had growing up, uh, other than move, you know, move from Montana to where you were uh, closer to that information, you know. But uh, going out to Oregon was was great. Um, uh, Mark Sprague, Denny Campbell, Floyd Vaughn. Uh, Jabby Young, Jim Ramsey, guys that, you know, were my coaches and impacted my life. Uh, man, I don't know if there could have been any better going anywhere, just just having more of it. But, but really, it has shaped my philosophy as a coach, right? And so when I think of those things, I think of how important the sport of wrestling was and how significant one of those experiences was. Uh, was to me at that age, right, where I had one interaction with Randy Lewis um, at the Olympic Games when I was 10 years old. And he said one thing, and I, I trained on that one thing for years. And I met Dave Schultz, and he signed my program, and I asked him a question, and he said one thing, and I trained on that one thing for years. And so um, when I look back at that, it it's humbling in a sense that I'm in a position to potentially influence others. And so it, it, I feel a tremendous responsibility to make those things very important and very valuable and uh, filled with the best information and character that they can be filled with because uh, you never know what kid is going to take that one thing and train on that thing for years. Um, so uh, it, it, you know, what's going on in the sport of wrestling right now is really uh, awesome to see a lot of young kids coming up with some great skill. Um, the NCAA tournament is a testament to that. Um, you know, first time since 1947, two true freshmen win this year, right, with uh, Spencer Lee and Yanni Diakmahalas, uh, both guys developmental world champions, right? Um, and when you look up and down the lineup of, of just the finals, you had several world medalists in, in previous cadet and junior world um, honors in in those um, that's a testament to to all of this stuff the advancement of society and technology and access to more video and in information and uh, you know our regional training centers are are functioning at a super high level because a lot of these kids have access to a regional training center where they can go uh, and not only learn technique but they can witness how the best guys in the world are doing it. And, and that mentorship is a really powerful learning tool. And, you know, that's just, uh, that's a Gable model, right? When I came in here, uh, Hawkeye Wrestling Club had 11 guys who are postgraduate uh, Olympic hopefuls. And so my level was elevated super quickly. Uh, and there was a steep learning curve because, because of that access. And so now we're trying to reproduce that on a large scale. And, and uh, it's exciting. Just the, oh, go ahead. What did, what did uh, what Randy Lewis tell you? What Dave Schultz tell you? Uh, you know, actually, Schultz didn't tell me anything. Uh, it was just a, a real sh- small window into his just philosophy, just life philosophy. So I'm standing in line. I'm the last kid in line, right? They're sweeping the building, and he's standing on the on the arena floor, reaching up through the balcony or through the the guardrail, right? And uh, there's like two adults in front of me, and the security guard's going to throw us out of the building because it's time to shut down, right? And he's like putting his hand in front of me and like pushing me out. He's like, hey, kid, we got to go. And Schultz, um, he looked at the guy. He was signing a, an adults program, and he looked at the guy. He's like, hey, man, why are you trying to make life so hard for everybody? L- let me sign the kid's program. And uh, so he signed my program, and what he didn't know is, like, my whole chest swelled up, right? Like, I was like, yeah, Dave Schultz, Olympic champion, just he stood up for me, right? And, uh, you know, later in life, I I was fortunate enough to meet Dave and get to work out with him and talk about technique and other things. And, you know, he was a super um, guy and great uh, ambassador for the sport, as everybody knows. It's... Uh, but he was a ferocious competitor, maybe one of the meanest guys that ever lived on the mat, but he's a super nice guy off the mat, right? So uh, 
just a philosophy that you can be good to people and and uh, you know you you can still be a super tough competitor and and, and maybe it allows you to be a tougher competitor. Um, Randy, uh, I remember right after '84, uh, Randy came to Montana. We had him come up and do a clinic, and he he showed me uh, uh, just specific technique on a, on a gut wrench that he was doing at the time. And from then on, in our club and in our part of the world, it was called the Randy Lewis grip, right? So we were doing that, and uh, it re- really became the bread and butter of my parterre offense at the time, and still is something that. Uh, that is effective, and I, I teach our senior level guys, and so um, you know those things are powerful. Those things are powerful, and so um, stuff like that. But I think it, um, as much as the information of what each of them shared, it was the significance and importance of what it meant to me, and what it meant to my brother, and what it meant to our family, and and uh, and we dedicated ourselves to it. We're at the World Cup, and we're going to have great competition here with eight teams. Does yeah, this awesome. competition in Iowa City have that potential you were talking about at the Olympic Games to elevate people to another level? For sure. For sure. Um, I mean, you said it right there, the top eight teams in the world, right? Top eight teams in the world in a in a totally unique uh, competition format, right, where it's a team competition, dual meet style, as opposed to your typical you know, individual event, right, line bracket. So it's it's going to be an awesome um, and really patriotic opportunity, uh, and no doubt there are kids like that in the state of Iowa and the surrounding states, and people that will fly in and travel in to see that. And and so, um, you know, the thing is about those that type of impact. Randy Lewis wasn't planning on having that impact, and Dave Schultz wasn't planning on having those that impact on me. It's just that they were. Um, that was the nature of their character, right? And I was I was receptive to that information at the time. So I don't know where that's going to be, which only further emphasizes the responsibility of me to make sure, be very careful about what we're promoting. And uh, this event, um, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a, a rocking arena with great crowd, and uh, there's going to be a amazing uh display of skill level from all the participating countries and hopefully ours is the best um and i think that's a recipe for that kind of chemistry and and, uh to really impact some some young some young wrestlers that are witnessing you know both in the arena and, and watching on tv or online or wherever else you lived in iowa city for over a decade why do iowans have a fascination with this sport you know, um, even before Gable, uh, wrestling has always been really strong in Iowa, right? I mean, not always, but, uh, you know, Harold Nichols and, and all these great coaches that came along. And and, and certainly uh, Gable has um, left a huge legacy in uh, his dedication and commitment to the sport um, has shaped it. And uh, the the attention that he was able to um, bring to the sport of wrestling, it increased its significance. And and probably not all these people are in love with the technique, like I'm in love with the technique, but you you start to relate to an individual. You relate to their personal story. And, and that um, forces you to pay attention, right? Because you feel a piece of yourself out there. And in our sport... Um, being a, being combative in a one-on-one, um, it's a lot more personal than a lot of sports. And so once you start to to draw those um, relations to people that are competing, it just has elevated. And so it's it's a testament to uh, a, a lot of things and a lot of people. And and Gable gets a lot of credit for that. And uh, you know, I would say that the positive image that he's been able to reflect on the sport of wrestling. Um, you know the, the the significance culturally in the state of Iowa is is a testament to what he's been able to do, and so um, it's exciting. You know, it's it's why I came here, and uh, it's why I'm coming back. And, and uh, it's exciting to have him on on the coaching staff as honorary coach, and and Coach Jay Robinson and Coach Mike DeRoe, who are all uh, we're all part of that legacy. And so uh, 
it's really cool. Do you think about reliving some of the old days and do some buddy carries with Andy Hamilton here in Carver? Did you do that? Yeah. A, a throwback? Course? Yeah, yeah. Jump on. Let's go. <laughs> Hey, we appreciate. Yeah, we've this been is awesome. t- we've been telling a lot of stories. You know, guys ask about it. So as we're just driving back and forth to the hotel, the, you know, the athletes, you know, Dave Taylor, Jordan Burroughs, or one of those guys will say, "Hey, coach, you know, what 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 did you guys do?" And so you know, there's Rustler's Hill on the back of Carver that uh, uh, we used to run that quite a bit. I'm pretty familiar with that spot, and uh, it's still there, which is cool to see. And you know, tell them about our our conditioning runs, you know, whether we ran the bike path or we ran the golf course and, you know, Gable would say, all right, hit the golf course, five hills and two buddy carries. And, you know, it was like a race. Gable, would, we'd be sitting on those bleachers and he'd say that. And it was like a barroom brawl to get out the door. Cause it was that intense of a race. Not that he said it was, it just, that was the competitive nature of the people, um, that you were teammates with. So those are, you know, those are, um, things that shaped you, so they're fond memories. Great to have you back in Iowa City. Thanks for taking this time with us. My pleasure. Thanks for doing it. Andy really enjoyed that interview with Bill Zadick. He was gracious enough to give us some time during the World Cup press conference. I think he has a great vision for what's going to happen for the United States, and I think he's the right man for the job. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the things that's interesting about Bill, I mean, you, you, you know, we've talked about how much success the United States has had at every level of the freestyle chain right now, right? I mean, you know, four world champs at the cadet level, uh, team world champions at the junior level, and then uh, obviously the team championship in Paris on the senior level. And Bill has had a connection to all those guys for the most part. I mean, he he was, uh, you know, instrumental in Kyle Snyder's development, uh, you know, the year that Kyle went out to the Olympic Training Center. Um, also, uh, you know, a guy that has, has fostered the, the growth of that, uh, that age division program as well. And, and, uh, a lot of people have, uh, have their fingerprints on that trophy that the United States won last year in Paris and bills are certainly, uh, um, certainly on that trophy as well. The, the, the imprint that, uh, he has put on the United States freestyle program, pretty tremendous. Up next, we have an opportunity to talk to Jordan Burroughs. We had a chance to talk to him in Tom Brands' office. He was gracious enough to let us have this office and lock the door and had Jordan Burroughs. I think we're the only people in the facility with Jordan. And we said ten, five to ten minutes and ended up being <laughs> 25 minutes, but well worth it. Yeah, always. Always a pleasure to talk to Jordan. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, time gets away from you when you're talking to him because there's so many things you want to ask him about. And then you look up and, you know, he, he just gives you, you know, such candid answers. And they're 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 super compelling, too. I mean, they really you know, he really makes you think. And uh, so when when you're done with it, you're like, you know, this, you know, seemed like it was probably about 10, 15 <laughs> minutes. And all of a sudden that's 25. And uh you know, I had one of those interviews like that with him out at Colorado Springs last summer at the Olympic Training Center World Team Camp. It uh, felt like it was felt like it was 15, and I looked up at the end, it was like 40. And uh, so it, it never seems like it's enough, though. I mean, because you, you feel like you could sit there and talk to him all day and uh, keep you know, never have a shortage of things you want to ask him or things you want to talk to him about. But, uh, you know, he is so gracious with his time and um uh, you know, we we talked to him about the uh, the role that he has played as the face of the franchise for USA Wrestling, and and I I really can't think of anyone that that could have done a better job. And I think when it's all said and done, I think when people look back, um, you talk about the people that have changed uh, United States wrestling for the better over the course of time. I think he's got to be on the short list. Be sure to stick around for this interview. We get a chance to sit down with a living legend, five-time world and Olympic champion, Jordan Burroughs. It's coming up next. We welcome in Jordan Burroughs, five-time world and Olympic champion, two-time NCAA champion, and one-time state champion. When I say that progression, do you ever think about that, how you've gotten to this high level after being a one-time state wrestling champion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's unique because I get the opportunity to tell people that through hard work, perseverance, and just really putting yourself in the right places that you can do really anything that you set your mind to. And so it's pretty interesting that I've won more NCAA titles 
than I did state titles, more world championships than NCAA championships, right? And it's uh it's cool, man. It's cool. I've worked hard for it. So how do you make that progression happen? Um, just hard work. Just hard work. I'm gonna take this jacket off. Just a lot of hard work and surrounding myself with the right people. Like I've been blessed with an opportunity to have a great circle of individuals around me. And so really all I ever had to do was work as hard as I could. And obviously I've made some of the right decisions. I've committed to the lifestyle and I've kept myself out of trouble and just surrounded myself with the folks that I wanted to be around and be a part of that could help me accelerate in my career and to help me live a life of excellence. But those people never really let me down. They put me in the right position. They kicked me in the butt when I was down and they made sure that I always stay focused and, and humbled me in a number of situations. So yeah, it was always good. I think back to your first college tournament. It was here in the state of Iowa. Harold Nichols Open. I think you went one and two. I did. And then, uh, what, like 16 and 13 your freshman year? 16 and 13. You took That's a big right. jump after that year. I did. What happened? Um, I spent a lot of time at Nebraska that summer. I really committed to the lifestyle of being the best wrestler in the country or being one of them, right? It was, I thought I knew what hard work was until I got to college, right? I was one of the hardest workers in my room in high school and I ran all the time and I would discipline myself to get down the weight. And I was a state champion as a senior. I was the best guy on my team in my city and in South Jersey. And so when I got to college, everyone was a state champ. Everyone was the best guy from their town. And I really didn't know how to handle going from being the coach's favorite at home to being a relative no one at the University of Nebraska. And so it took me a little bit of adjusting, figuring out how to get out of legs, figuring out how to have setups for my feet from a technical aspect, but really like balancing the lifestyle of, okay, if you really want to do this, you've got to separate yourself by your effort level and your work ethic every single day. And it's not just about doing it once or twice. It's about consistency. Like how many good practices can you have in a row and then putting it together where when you compete, believing that you can win and going out there and performing. And so that big jump really happened when I decided to stay throughout the entire summer. I really committed to lifting weights full time. And then also I I just started to believe that I was capable of doing some really good stuff. I started to get pretty solid with my double leg and I started to develop as a wrestler. I went up to 149 the coaches started to believe in me. They knew that I was the guy and kind of that belief from those guys kind of helped propel me to the next level. How do you stay humble? I came from 16 and 13 as a freshman. Like I wasn't always the best guy. I was never the best guy, right? I was never undefeated until my junior year of college was the first season I had ever been undefeated in my entire life. Right. And so that relative obscurity was just it's easy for me to be like this because this was normal for me. Everything that I do now within the expectation because of the hard work and the sacrifices that I've made is always the, you came from nothing, right? You came from nothing. You worked really hard to be here. You had a lot of people help you to arrive at this moment. So I try to take a lot less credit for my success than the world would have me believe that I've actually earned because of it. And so I try to stay humble. I try to make sure that I understand that this is all fleeting, but it's fun. Like I, I enjoy what I do and I, I'm confident in my abilities, but I let other people tell me, you know, what I'm capable of. I, I know what I can do. I know what I've done. And the record kind of speaks for itself. I just go out there and train and, and hope to get my hand raised. After the 2017 World Championships, you said that you're no longer the face of USA Wrestling. It's now yeah, Kyle Snyder. What's absolutely. your role now? Um, my role is, I'm kind of like, I don't know, it's tough, man. I, I think that, you know, everyone has a point in their career where even though I would remain a superstar in the limelight of the sport period, I think that everyone has a phase in which you have young, exciting athletes come through that are just doing extremely good things, right? As great as LeBron James is, people are excited about Steph Curry and James Harden and Kevin Durant. Like all these guys are amazing athletes and that's no shot at LeBron. Like he's still one of the best players in the world, but you just, you do what you can, right? And you don't worry about who the face is. You just get excited about being in the presence of greatness, right? Like I'm in a unique situation where I went from, there were a few years where I was the only medalist with no other guys on the team that were bringing home medals to where we're all capable of being world champs. And so I've seen it on both sides of the fence 
And I'm excited to be a part of something great now where like we're stepping out this weekend, like unquestionably the favorites. Like if we don't bring home a World Cup championship this weekend, it's a big time bust for us. And so, you know, being a part of a generation of young athletes that are amazing at what they do, I feed off of that and I thrive off. And I don't want to retire because I want to be with those guys. Like I want to see what Kyle's going to do. Like I want to be his teammate. I want to see what James is going to do in the future. I want to be teammates with Spencer Lee, like these guys, Thomas Gilman. Like it was crazy because a lot of the guys that are a part of the team now were when I won my first title, I won my first NCAA championship in 2009. Like it's almost been a decade, right? These guys were babies when I was winning. Um, and now I'm teammates with them. And so it's cool. It's cool to be a part of that. Like, I feel like I've, my career has extended amongst a long period of time in which I can be a part of something that people were once watching, hoping to be a part of and kind of show them what it's like and how to maneuver and how to navigate the landscape. You're a popular guy in this sport. When you send out a tweet or say something, people gravitate toward that. What's that like having that opportunity to do that? But uh, how, how do you take that responsibility? On? It's a gift and a curse. It's definitely a gift and a curse because there's some situations in which people want you to speak about, right? That isn't necessarily necessary, right? And so like, I think that in this position, people feel that my voice is powerful. So they're like, okay, well, bros, what do you think? Right. And so you're almost tricked into having an opinion on every particular situation in every circumstance, but doesn't necessarily need to be spoke upon, or at least not publicly. Right. Like there are a lot of things that I believe, or I have a stance on that I don't feel like is necessary for me to share. Um, but then there are things that I feel strongly about that I'm like, sure. I'm aware of the situation and I will allow for the public to know my political stance or my particular opinion on a certain subject. And so, yeah, it's a gift and a curse. I appreciate it. I get a lot of respect in the wrestling community and it's not because I demand it. It's just because I've done such a great job in the sport for such a long period of time. And so I always try to remain diplomatic. Like if you watch and see the things that I do, I try to remain neutral and try to stay out of controversy. And so whenever I speak, I try to make sure that I have something worth saying and that people want to listen to. And so, yeah, I try to just eliminate all the noise and just put out the good stuff. When I think back uh, to my first interview with you, 2009, coming off a third place finish in St. Louis, yeah. you're shy. You're yeah. kind of quiet. If you go back and watch my old interviews, they were awful. Awful. <laughs> what happened? How did you get to this point where you've been such an incredible, um, you know, ambassador for wrestling in the United States, but also, I mean, so, so good with the media. I had to, like, I really had to, it's almost like as if you're a young prince, right. Preparing and being groomed into this role. And then all of a sudden the King dies and they're like, all right, 13 year old prince, here you are, you're the new King. And now you've got to figure out how to navigate this landscape on your own with a lot of things that were still yet to be taught to you. And from that position, I be became a figurehead in the sport in 2011. Once I won that world championship and became the team's only world champion since 2006, after Henry Cejudo's retirement, I was the guy, right? And so immediately USA Wrestling was molding me into this figure that could be a hero for the sport, that could be the face of the sport, that could be charismatic in interviews and be personable and be someone that wanted to be followed. And I, I did desire those things. Like I wanted to be a star. I wanted to have my own wrestling shoe and be the crossover athlete that could transition from just the sport of wrestling and be broad enough to appeal to all of America and all of the world essentially. And so, yeah, it was, it was a lot of grooming, a lot of grooming and a lot of growing up relatively quickly. And so it was difficult at the time. There were a lot of times where I'm like, man, I wish I could just be like normal. I want to do normal stuff. I want to say funny stuff on Twitter, right? I want to go out and eat in public and have a beer. Like I just want to do normal things. But within that grooming and that molding was a life of excellence that I learned to enjoy and be happy with. And then also bring other people into. And so it was, it was for the best. It was for the best becoming the ambassador. And then through that, I had to learn how to just be the guy that could maneuver in a room full of people, right. To shake hands with dignitaries and, you know, and 
do fundraisers and give speeches to the world. Like all those things I had to learn how to do when I wasn't from, I wasn't cut from that cloth. Like my parents are middle-class working class people, right? They're still working full time. My dad's a construction worker. My mom is a pension processor and they're relatively low key, right? I came from a public school. I was only the second state champ in my school's history. No tradition, no heritage, no lineage. And I had to be created into this person to do what I'm doing now. And so it was a long process, but it was fun. What went into grooming? What what kind of things did you do to become good with the media? That's a good question. I'd say a lot of interviews, right? The more I won, the more interviews were demanded of me. Whenever there was a media summit, I would be the guy that was sent to that media summit, right? And so just through repetition, a ton of practice, um, and then just like some refinement, there were people who would tell me particular things like, okay, hey, JB, here's what you should say as opposed to this. Here's a synonym for this word that makes it sound, you know, more diplomatic as opposed to, you know, like a young, immature individual. And so I started to learn how to be more political with my speech, but also how to enjoy the lifestyle that I had created for me, right? And so I didn't want to be the, like this guy, like, hey, you know, I'm Jordan Burroughs. Nice to meet you, you know, JB for president. But I also wanted to be like, hey, listen, like we can do this, but we can do this at a high level. Like if you watch the way some of the best athletes in the world maneuver, like they are really good at what they do, right? Like LeBron James, as appealing as he is to the culture of the city of Akron and all the African-American community, he still can walk in a room full of CEOs and be the man, right? And so like, that's what I always wanted to do. I wanted to be able to connect with my culture, with my peers, but also like when I'm in a room full of people that are extremely accomplished, whether it's financially or, you know, they're just bosses. I just wanted to be able to be comfortable in all of those settings. And I think I've been able to accomplish that. Lee Kemp, who was a three-time world champion in your weight class, nonetheless said that when he was growing up, that when he looked at amateur wrestling news and saw Lloyd Kieser, who was African-American like he was, he could connect with that. Yeah. Do you feel like you have that connection that you have African-American kids saying a, a certain thing and, and a connectability that you're making an impact in that group? I hope so. I hope so. Um, you know, and it's tough because I want to appeal across all cultures, across all races, but absolutely, I'm a black man. So it's especially near and dear to me that people who look like me have a hero, right? When I was growing up, I didn't really know wrestling. I didn't know Kenny Monday and Nate Carr and all of these amazing wrestlers that had trailblazed and paid the way for me before I got a chance to get on the international scene. I didn't know those guys until I realized that I could be one of those guys. And so for young kids, right, that have social media that can follow their favorite athletes, I'm the representation of what you can be coming from the inner city, from urban areas, coming from the hood. Like it's not easy for those people, right? When I was growing up in a predominantly African-American neighborhood, everybody played basketball or football. Right. No one wrestled. It was like taboo. No one wanted to do what we did. And, you know, I'm, I, I like to tell people like, listen, wrestling's cool. Like you can do this. I've traveled the world. I met my wife. I made a great living. I can take care of my family. Like I've become a relatively successful individual from the sport of wrestling. And I think that in the African American community that can really translate for a lot of young men and women. And so Beat the Streets is doing a good job throughout the country. They do an amazing job at, you know, showing kids that there's more ways to make it outside of their particular circumstance than, you know, the mainstream avenues of, you know, football and basketball and baseball and all those, which all those things are amazing. But I think wrestling really teaches a lot of characteristics that help you develop into a particularly strong individual. Many are saying we're in the best time for wrestling in the history of our sport. You're part of that. Does it yeah. feel good to know that you're driving part of that? Yeah. I like to take responsibility for starting it. Right. And so like, I am kind of the guy through the alley-oop to the rest of the country. Like, listen here, the water's warm, like get in, you know, like we're, we're ready for you. We're ready for this. Like this is the time and place in which everything that I helped build over the last seven years now these guys, I can pass off the rock and they can go 
and slam it home, right? Kyle Snyder and Thomas Gilman and Logan Steber and all these young guys, like this is, this is theirs now, right? This is theirs. And so I think as a leader, you want to create individuals that come up under you that are better than you. And that can lead the way to the next generation, right? I'm, I was just the segue for the next generation of guys coming up. And so I take pride in that, knowing that I started it. I was the original superstar in the sport in the social media era. And now we've got a lot of stars that are going to make a lot of money and be extremely successful and do some amazing things moving forward. And it's really going to be cool. When you got into this 2011 you go from ncaa champion hodge trophy winner world champion all in the same year and you start looking at winning six and you know getting into john smith territory now yeah. you're at five yeah. do you have any idea what you were getting into at the beginning when you first started thinking about that no i was just talking crazy <laughs> um it, i mean it's it's very difficult to do what john did right just the consistency of it right and kyle snyder's halfway right well this i was halfway right we were both three for three at this particular point in time but six in a row is absolutely incredible um and it's one of those things it's like arbitrary like i th- i feel like no matter how good you are there's always going to be particular individuals who think that you are the best of all time right if everyone's mount rushmore of wrestling looks different right some people will have kale some people are like well kale only won one olympics no world championship some people have dan gable some people are like oh well, dan only won one of each right and so like it, it it varies in terms of being the greatest of all times and so like i wanted to translate that into okay well i want to be the winningest wrestler of all time like win the most championships right and the difficulty within that is like, okay, well, does that really maximize your potential, right? Like is winning the most championships really make you feel like you've done the most you can in this sport. And so like, I want to just like transcend all accomplishments and just like do what I love for a long period of time, as long as I can. And being an icon, like is so much more than just winning in this sport. And so um, I've had a lot of fun with it. I try not to compare myself to any of the greats in this sport just because it loses a lot of respectability from the perspective that these guys have also done some extremely incredible things. And it's just a new era, like, right? Like those guys had their era. They were amazing. Let John rest in his six championships. I'll move forward in this era. I'll do my thing. And then following up on my heels will be Kyle Snyder for however long he decides to compete. And then, there's another little kid right now who's like 10 years old who's going to, you know, show his face 12 years from now and set the world on fire that no one knows, right? And so the world keeps going, right? Things keep ticking regardless if you're a part of it or not. And so I try to not hang my hat on my accomplishments and really just hang my hat on what I've been able to do and how long I've been able to do it and how much fun I've had while doing all of those things. When it's, when it's all said and done, whenever that is, when you, you hang it up for, for good, uh, what's next? What do you want to do after wrestling's over? Do you want to coach? Do you want to get into something else? What? I don't, I don't want to coach. I don't want to coach. I've got some business ventures that I'd like to attempt, right? Business is a very difficult endeavor, but I, I've got some things that I'd like to do. I got some things. I, like. I just really want to spend more time with my family Honestly, wrestling is difficult in the fact that I'm the only guy on the team with any kids. I'm the only guy on the team that's married. And so I'm in a unique position. These guys, right, all they do is watch Netflix and play Fortnite all day, right? But I got to I could take my kids to school. I got to hang out with my wife. I got to make sure she's okay. I got to make sure the kids are getting bath and getting their teeth brushed and getting what they need in terms of food and nutrition. And so, like, my day is, is just very different in that aspect. And I my son's getting to an age now where he needs me. He needs me at home. Like he needs someone correcting his behavior. He needs the enforcer in the household to be there. Like, okay, son, this is how you operate. This is how the boroughs represent themselves when we're in public. And so that's the only difficult thing for me. Like I, if I would wrestle forever, if my family could always be with me, right? If they could be with me at all times and I didn't have to leave them for long periods of time, I'd wrestle until I wrestle until 2024. Easily. I go another cycle after this cycle, but my son, he's beacons. He's going to start school in 2020, right? My little girl's following closely behind him. She's only two years behind. 
and we're in the Midwest. My wife's from New York. I'm from New Jersey. So when I leave for two weeks, my wife's just grinding at home, just the three of them. And so, you know, for me, it's finding a particular balance where I can be happy doing what I love, but also I can make sure my family's well taken care of at home. And so, yeah, it's one of those things where I'm not sad because of it. You know, it's just, it's life. Life happens and you make adjustments and you prepare accordingly and you enjoy what you can while you can. Is there one of the five world Olympic golds that you're most proud of? Um, Yeah, this most recent one. Absolutely. The most recent, like first it was 2011, but I think after, you know, what happened to me in Rio, being able to come back and do what I did this past year was, I mean, it's huge, man. It, Cause it was tough, bro. Like this was one of the hardest years of my life in terms of trying to come back and have a successful year with all the chatter from all the people around me. Right. Some people tell me, okay, well you need to do this now, or you need to train this way, or you need to leave Nebraska, or you're not good enough in this position, or you're no good anymore. You're old, you're domesticated. You can't do what you once did. Right. Like there were just so many mental battles that I had to fight the entire year compounded by Kyle date coming back down to 74 and trying to beat me. Right. And just like, it, it was just very difficult. Like I had lost a lot of my confidence from my performance in Rio, I had felt like I had failed at accomplishing one of my goals. And so it was just the overall, just all encompassing, just uncomfortability of being in a bad place for a long period of time, trying to figure out, man, what do I do next? Is this worth it? Do I still want to compete? Do I want to quit? Right. And so I remember Manning and Snyder, they came to my house. This was like in October. I took like a few months off the mat and uh, they came and sat down. They were like, listen, when you started this journey, like you told us you wanted to be the best wrestler in the world. Like you wanted to break John Smith's record for most world championships ever. I'm like, I know I did. And they're like, well, what's changed? You know, like it, what's changed? Like you still can break it. It's just going to take you a little bit longer now. Right. And uh, that kind of like, was profound in terms of, I can't, you're right. You know, I can still do this. I can still do this. And so I thought about it and I'm like, okay, well, I got a trophy case at home, right? I put all my medals and my belts in Olympic gold in this particular spot. And now there's an empty spot, right? This is Rio 2016. There's nothing here, right? And so I could either hang my hat knowing that I didn't win the gold medal in Rio in 2016 and watch someone else at 74 kilos win it in Paris or, I could say, okay, you know what? I'm going to take this name tag off and I'm just going to put Paris 2017 here and try to come back and actually fill the spot with something. And so I worked really hard, man. I worked really hard. Both, I may always work hard physically, but the mental battles were the toughest last year, really trying to get back to a good place psychologically and mentally and spiritually. Just like, man, am I, can I do this? Can I still do this? Like, am I still the best at what I do? And then, it, I mean, it was a struggle, right? Because it's like within that now Kyle's coming on, right? Kyle's, Kyle's the man now. He's winning at a high level. He's super elite. And he's become, you know, the face of the wrestling community just from like, because he's, he's, he's young, right? He's fresh. He's young. He's exciting. He's fun to watch. He's still in college. So he's got a lot of connectability. And, you know, dealing with that pressure of being replaced at the same time of trying to figure out my place and whether it even remains in the sport, like it was a difficult time period for me. And so, yeah, this was, it was very rewarding to come back and win this one. You mentioned Kyle Dake, also David Taylor. They were both in your weight class at one point. They're now on the world cup team yeah. with you. What's it like to build a relationship with people who were once your rivals? It's great, man. It's great. And I respect those dudes a lot. I respect those dudes a lot, man. I uh, have just a great time being in their presence and being a part of everything that they've got going on because I know how hard it is for those guys to be in the position that they're in, right? Like, they're some of the most successful wrestlers of the last 10 years and just fan favorites. Like, people like to watch those guys wrestle. They appreciate their success in the sport. And so seeing those guys be involved for such a long period of time and go, like, unwavered in their belief in themselves and then unwavered in terms of their perspective, like just remaining 
vigilant in trying to accomplish and attain their goals, even though they've never made world teams. Like that's been impressive. It's been very impressive and encouraging. Like it's not just about winning golds and winning Olympic medals and winning world championships. Like these dudes have stayed in it with no success in terms of the grand scheme, right? And in, in, in reaching the pinnacle, they've stayed at it. They stayed at it. They battled. They've, you know, been close. They've both been second at the world team trials. Kyle Dake was second at the Olympic trials. Like they've been so close to the success and the glory that they've sought for so long a period of time. And they just stayed at it. And so I commend those dudes a lot. And they both help elevate me in a number of ways. And they've helped elevate the wrestling community. Like if you talk about the top five American wrestlers of all time, you got to mention both of those two guys regardless whether they're world teamers or not. So, yeah, it's good to have them around. And I think that it kind of lightens the mood a little bit. There's no tension now when we're all in the room together because we're all at different weight classes. And so we can save the rivalry for, you know, a few years from now in Tokyo when they condense the weight classes back to six. But I think for the time period and the time being, it's there's no pressure and we can just be relaxed and be friends and try to beat the Russians. We've been talking with Jordan Burroughs here in Tom Brands' office. Appreciate yeah. the time. This is fun. We have the World Cup, and we'll be talking to you after you get a World Championship and World Cup victory. Great interview with Jordan Burroughs, as advertised, one of the best ones we've had on this podcast. Really enjoyed his insight and what he had to say about being that leader, that guy that kick things off for where we are in the United States. He talked about how he really got us to this era of maybe the best era for wrestling in the United States. And Jordan Burroughs certainly has his influence on where we are today. Like he said, come on in, jump in. The water's warm, right? Yeah. You know, when he was, he was the first guy winning. Think about where the United States was in 2011. You know, hadn't been a world champion since 2006 with Bill Zadick. Uh, Henry Cejudo got out. After 2008, after winning Olympic gold, and uh, the United States went through some tough times there. Went through some really tough times, and and there was a lot of searching for answers. At, at, you know what was going wrong, what needed to be fixed. You know Zeke Jones uh, adopted the regional training center model. I think his, um, you know his imprint on that is pretty significant. And uh, looked at at what Russia was doing. And I, th- I think Zeke probably wanted to, uh, I think ideally, I think they wanted to bring all the athletes into Colorado Springs and have them train in together, but that wasn't realistic, right? I mean, you know, you can't pull kids out of high schools and kids out of colleges uh, and bring them to Colorado Springs. So what do you do? You you take the regional training center model and take Colorado Springs all across the country and put it in Iowa City, put it in Stillwater, put it in State College in Ithaca, New York, um, everywhere across the country. And all of a sudden now you've got uh, high school kids that are getting access um, to how Jordan Burroughs trains, to how Kyle Snyder trains. Um, you you have uh, those guys getting out there and scrapping with high level college guys. I mean, we're in the Iowa room and Aaron Brooks is rolling around with Jaden Cox and uh, and Kyle Dake and and uh, out in Colorado Springs, the world team world team training camp last year, you got uh, David Carr rolling around with James Green and Jason Nolf and, you know, Gable Stevenson scrapping with Nick Wisdowski and Kyle Snyder. And and the best part about it all is they're not taking a back seat. They're out there trying to get to their offense. They're trying trying to score points They're trying to win. And, uh, you know, we've seen that manifest itself overseas at the cadet level at the junior level where these guys are going on and you know if if they've gone toe to toe with Kyle Snyder, Jordan Burroughs, James Green, the best guys in the world at the senior level, you think they're afraid of guys at the cadet and junior level? And uh yeah. you know they're stepping out there fully expecting to win world titles and it's also uh you know Bill has used the the term pattern of dominance where where you start stringing together world titles multiple world titles in your, your age division and you're moving up the ladder and doing that uh, as you go from cadets to juniors. And then, then you're prepared to do it at the senior level too. You think about Spencer Lee, um, Mark Hall, guys that have, that are climbing the ladder, winning world titles every step of the way. Uh, I, I, you know, we're in a, we're in a unique position right now where um, I think 2020 is going to be a tremendous amount of fun. I, I can't wait. You know, you start looking down the line, 2024, 
and and who's going to still be in the game yeah. at that point and and who's going to be on the climb. Jordan talked about, uh, you know, there's a 10 year old out there somewhere right now that we don't know about. <laughs> it's going to be a superstar, too. Yeah. Um, but it's it's set up well. It's it's really set up well now for years to come because of uh, uh, guys like Jordan Burroughs. Guys like Bill Zadick, guys like Zeke Jones, Kyle Snyder. There's so many people that have played a role in this. I mean, hundreds and you know maybe thousands of people that have played some kind of role in where the United States is right now uh, from a men's freestyle standpoint. And uh, pretty exciting times that we're in right now and certainly to come. We had a chance to talk with Bill Zadick and Jordan Burroughs at Carver Hawkeye Arena. We had a chance to catch up with David Taylor, who's representing the United States at 189 pounds for the World Cup team over the phone. His interview is coming up next. We bring in another great guest for the World Cup, David Taylor, four-time NCAA championship finalist, two-time NCAA champion, and a two-time U.S. Open champion. But more importantly, he is the reigning World Cup champion at 189 pounds. He'll be competing in the World Cup this weekend in Iowa City at 189 pounds. How are you, David? I'm great. It's uh, it's nice to be in Iowa and have people cheering for you. That's for sure. <laughs> are you sure they're going to? Have you kind of have you done the the research to make sure they're all going to be cheering for you? You know, I'm not sure. I, I was looking around. And I was kind of looking and trying to visualize what we see this dance. I can visualize a lot of stalling calls, even though the rest of the freestyle. <laughs> um, but overall, I think that it's, uh, it's going to be great. I- I'm so excited to be here. I- I'm so excited to wrestle in Carver, uh, Hawkeye arena with just the great fan support, um, that the Hawkeyes have, plus just the people that are coming in to watch the United States wrestle in the United States. It's going to be a pretty special opportunity. Anytime we get the opportunity to wrestle in the United States, representing the United States is, is pretty special. So, um, I know we are all very excited to step on the mat and compete this weekend. Have you had a chance to walk around and get some of the Iowa fans talking to you and knowing who you are? Yeah, you know, I think that's one thing that's pretty unique about there's a few places I think in the country that are like that. I think, you know, Penn State is one of them and I think Iowa is one of them. I think I would say Oklahoma State. Just where wrestling is so ingrained in the community that, you know, you walk around, you're going out to EM just today we were at the Bluebird Diner and uh you know just a couple of people i was there with chris cunningham and bo nickel and myself and just a couple one a couple guys come up to us and you know i was congratulated bo and i uh, wish us luck for this weekend i think you know collegiate wrestling creates such an awesome fan base and it's obviously pretty it's pretty you know strong true towards you know if you're a hawkeye fan you're a, hawkeye, you're a penn state fan you're a penn state fan but when what i've noticed you know especially from a coaching staff as well but when you come together and wrestle the united states that stuff's off the window we're all wrestling for the same team and i think that's one thing you that we're going to see this weekend. And I think I'd be really, really adamant um, to start support, uh, you know, for one, for one goal. Right. And that's the United States to do well. Have you ever thought about how close you were to being a cyclone? I was talking to Casey today, um, you know, because Coach, Coach Cunningham was uh, the assistant coach at Iowa State at the time. And, and Bo was like, man, you guys almost lived here. And it's just kind of crazy to think, you know, how, how much that changed just, I know in my career personally, um, you know, not this, you know, maybe uh, who knows what, I, what how I, what, what I would have happened if I would continue to stay at Iowa State. I believe that, you know, we would have done well and, and things like that. But I just think that move, you know, just don't, you know, when, when go to the East Coast, uh, go to Penn State, you know, just how it really changed, you know, changed my career, my life. And I do really think that that move overall changed the, the sport of wrestling. I think just the excitement and, um, you know, the success that Penn State's had has been, you know, pretty incredible and it's great and who knows what would happen if that never happened so it's uh it's pretty crazy to kind of think how the last 10 years have, have shaped up and that was one of the biggest turning points is just thinking i was going one direction and ended up in another one and ended up being a great decision so many people have talked about the penn state culture you were at the beginning stages of that as you mentioned how would you describe what the penn state wrestling culture is like for those who are curious about how you guys are getting it done well i'd say just you know, the biggest thing is just it starts at the top, right? It starts our coaching staff, um, you know, with which Coach Kale and Coach Casey and uh, Coach Cody and 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 Warner, just and, and how they conduct themselves, and then we're just a direct reflection of those guys. You know, we see them and how they carry themselves and how they conduct themselves and the way the you know the way that they compete and practice and their mentality, and you know, we just it becomes you know I've always been a big thing of your product of your environment, so. 
when you see those people that you look up to, from, from my, for me as an example, I looked up to Kale my whole life. I wanted to wrestle like him. I wanted to talk like him. I wanted to be like him. So, you know, nothing changed. When I had the opportunity to be around him all the time, you know, just if he said do this, I would do that. You know, and I think the more that you can buy into someone that's been ultra successful as a wrestler and now as a coach, you know, they really understand, um, I think, what it takes. And I think that's where the culture starts. And um, every time I think now, you know, whether it was planned or if it was raw emotion, you know, Bo Nickel said it best. I think at this point in time, when you come to Penn State, you know, you're just, you believe that you're going to be a national champion. You believe that you're going to win big matches. And I, I believe that that was just raw emotion, you know, coming from Bo just in the moment. Um, but I think that really couldn't be said any clearer. And I just think that's the mentality. Uh, not that winning is important. You know, I just think that you, it is important, but I think that's winning has never been talked about in our room. It's about continuing to progress every single day. And that culture starts top and, you know, we believe it. And I think everyone that comes in, you know, you believe it as well, whether you want to, or whether you're just part of the environment. You graduated in 2014. Do you still feel like you're part of the Penn state culture? I know you wrestle there, but do you feel like you're an extension of the college wrestling program? I mean, I, my heart will always be, with Penn State, you know, every time they step on the mat, I want them to do well. And every, you know, these, especially this group that's coming through right now, these kids that are juniors and seniors, you know, the Zanes and Bo and Knopf and Shenzo and Mark Hall and, and those kind of guys. Just, you know, I look at those guys as like little brothers to me, you know, just they're a few years younger and I've seen them develop over time. And it's been pretty special to watch those guys grow as athletes and people and leaders over time. So it's just been you know, they push me every single day, every time, every opportunity that I get to wrestle those guys. I mean, they're great. I mean, they, they're helping me achieve my goals. I'm trying to help them achieve their goals. So I think it's a, you know, mutual, um, you know, mutual in time that we get an opportunity to wrestle each other. But, you know, I just, I love Penn State and um, they've done, they provide a lot of opportunities for me. And um, anytime that I can be around that program and uh, be a part of it. It's pretty special. Jake Varner was the last Olympic gold medalist that the state of Iowa has produced. He won it in 2012. He's a guy I don't really know much about, don't know much about his personality. Fill us in on what Jake Varner's like. Jake Varner, uh, well, he gets most of his jokes from Kale. So <laughs> you know, I think if it depends on you know, how funny you think Kale is, probably determine how funny you think Varner is. But ultimately, Varner is, uh, he's an amazing person. Just, just, Obviously, his success speaks for himself. Be a four-time national finalist, two-time national champion, world bronze medalist, Olympic gold medalist. You know, I think a lot of people, he, you know, he just doesn't necessarily get the credit that he deserves for being as great of a wrestler he is. And he's just so great. And just the way that, you know, he's in there every single day, you know, helping guys continue to achieve their goals. And, you know, whether it's, you know, I have a pretty tough training regimen and he's in there pushing me and, and, uh, making, you know, anytime that I'm next to Varner and seeing how much he's squatting, it's definitely getting the most out of me as much as well. So, I mean, just, he, he's very dedicated to wanting guys to do well. And, um, he's a pretty special guy. I mean, just, like I said earlier, the, you know, he, he was kind of the first guy that was around Kale. Um, you know, kind of, I think, I think I was actually maybe Kale's first recruiting class. So he's been around the longest. And I think when you're around people like that, you know, you're going to, you're going to be pretty successful in whatever you do. And I think Varner's a, a great example of, of what can happen when you're around great people. You had an amazing World Cup run last year. When you think about all that you've accomplished in your career, is that the, the number one thing, your your best performance you've had so far? I would have to say that, you know, going into that competition last year, I mean, a year ago, um, I mean, I, just with the, you know, whether we were going to go to Iran and compete or not, I mean, it was kind of up in the air, but in my mind, I knew that, to go there and I knew the teams that were going to be there that I was going to have the toughest tournament, the toughest four matches I've ever had in my life in succession. So I was prepared regardless. In my mind, we were going, I was wrestling, I was going to wrestle, um, you know, world and Olympic champions. So I was prepared um, to go there and wrestle the best that I possibly could. And I think, you know, last year I continued, I've made progress each and every time I stepped on the mat. And I believe that, um, you know, that was a good example of when I was able to wrestle with the best of my abilities and um, just, any, you know, obviously excited for the opportunity to represent the United States and represent, um, you know, all, all the time and effort and hard work and adversity of, of being really close and not quite being there. Um, you know, it was just really nice to get that opportunity to go wrestle against that high co quality competition. So, um, you know, I look back and I think that's a great building block on my international career. I think I've struggled. Um, necessary to get my best performance. And I think that was kind of when I finally broke through 
And now I know, you know, every time I step on the mat, I believe in what I can bring for six minutes. Um, you know, and whether I win or whether I lose that match, you know, I think that really gave me a lot of confidence in what to expect of myself when I step out there and um, knowing that every single time I got to fight for every single point, regardless of who it is. So um, I'm very thankful for that opportunity and I can't wait to con- to represent uh, the country again this year. What kind of rep, uh, what kind of reception did you get from the Iranian people after you pinned Yazdani Chirati in Iran? Well, I think I, you know, I think the Iranian wrestling fans are, they may be the most, um, in terms of like following of wrestling. I mean, they may be the most, uh, followers. I mean, I think you look on any, any one of our, you know, Instagrams or followings. I mean, from an international perspective, I mean, if I post something out there, 50% of my comments are probably Iranian fans. Um, I think, they have short memories. I think now every time that I'm on there, they're always talking about how Yazdani is going to beat me 10-0. <laughs> um, but, you know, ultimately, I think it's just it's just a their culture for wrestling is, is it's pretty cool. So, you know, kind of, I think it's been pretty, for the most part, really positive, except when I, when I want them, when they think I'm going to wrestle Yazdani, I think you know, they, they uh, definitely want Yazdani to win. And, and he's kind of the pride of, of their country and their culture. Um, you know, just his, the reception that he was, he, he receives after, you know, he's had some success over the last couple of years. It's pretty, it's pretty cool to see that in the sport of wrestling. So just, to, but to be able to, you know, obviously to be able to wrestle a real guy of that caliber is pretty, it's pretty great. And I think the fans, they love, I mean, fans love great wrestlers and they love great wrestling. So they know that, you know, the guys that they like watching, I mean, they're going to follow and they're going to follow very closely. And when you have the opportunity to wrestle one of their best guys, I mean, they're going to be very involved all the time. So I'd say overall, just, you know, being exposed to, to um, I think after that match, to be exposed to their culture has been pretty awesome just because, you know, they have so much culture in the sport of wrestling and, you know, to support whether it's positive or negative or whatever it is. I mean, you know, they're definitely paying attention and they're supporting everything that I'm doing. So it's pretty cool to see that. David, when uh, you get yourself geared up for Yazdani and, and wrestling him on American soil for, you know, probably thinking about that for weeks, maybe months, and and whoever Russia sends, you know, at, at 86 kilos is going to be probably one of the best guys in the world. And then you find out uh, that they're not coming. What did the, what did that do for you? Well, I think, you know, like I talked mentioned before, I mean, any time, you know, I think at one point in my career, it was, hey, let's go try and find a tournament that I can do well in. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the best competition, you know. But I think at this point in my career, I bust my butt every single day, whether I'm training and I'm putting as much effort as I possibly can. And I do that because I want to wrestle the best people. I want to challenge myself. And I want to know where I stand with the best guys. So any time that you get the opportunity to wrestle those guys, I mean, it's great. It's hard. You know, it's hard to find a tournament where you're going to get, you know, World Cup's a super special event when guys want to send their best teams to represent their country and do well. And, you know, just, it, it means a lot to be a world cup champion from a team perspective. So, you know, when you get those teams together, you're going to wrestle their best guys. So I think it just means a lot, you know, to have that opportunity to do that. And, um, did it, did it, it didn't change my training by any means, but I'm um, definitely looking forward to any time I get to wrestle the best guys. Um, just, I want to, I want to see where I'm at. I want to see where, what I've been doing and if it's working, if it's in the right direction, because if it's not working, I want to make adjustments so I can be the best in the world. Um, and if it's working, well, I want to continue to build on that so I can continue to try and work towards that goal of being the best guy in the world. So it didn't change my training. It didn't change my mindset. I know when I step out there this weekend, I'm going to get four matches of the best guys. It doesn't matter who they are or what country they're from. I mean, there's those countries are sending those guys because they want to get the experience and they want to, see where those guys are at for the same reason where I was last year as kind of an unknown international wrestler. So it's, uh, it's going to be great regardless. Um, no matter who it steps out, when you, when you wrestle those guys in that country, they're going to be ready to scrap for every single second. And so will I be, and I'm looking forward to put my best effort for it. Um, when I step on the mat, you, uh, obviously coming off, uh, your Regan title in uh, January and, and beat some top level guys there. What, what uh, were takeaways from that tournament for you? Things that uh, you liked about the way you wrestled things that maybe you want to fine tune. Well, I think, you know, I was challenged right off the bat with the Cuban. Um, he's a guy who's been around for a while, very hard to score on. And I think I was, you know, I did a lot of movement and I wasn't as committed to my attacks. I took a lot of attacks. I think I shot like 16 or 17 times in that match before I scored. Um, so, I mean, I was making a lot of attempts 
and I wasn't really following through with them. And I found myself down four zero with short time left and I was able to get two takedowns. So, I mean, just that, uh, you know, that experience of that match was great. Just being in a position where having to score with short time and then, you know, having to defend was a great way to get started. Um, then wrestling, uh, they got from Turkey. He was a, uh, two time world silver medalist, Olympic silver medalist and, and being a, and a, you know, I thought I wrestled better in that match. I thought I better wrestle better and better each match moving forward, you know, having to wrestle uh, Russian, probably Russian's best guy in the semis, um, the Fonov, who's junior world champion last year and has beaten um, probably the, he's beaten Valiev, who represented the world championships last year. He beat Kruglia, who won the Europeans last year. So, you know, I think he's probably right now their best guy, have an opportunity to wrestle him. And then in the finals, um, you know, Turkey's having a little bit, I think, of uh, maybe who's going to be the next guy uh, with Gasar. And uh, the guy wrestling in the finals has beaten Gasar this year. So, I'd say that each match I wrestled better and better. Um, I think the biggest takeaway was I finally started getting my part tear going toward the end in the semis and finals was able to just convert into some, op- some opportunities where I'm really comfortable, you know, just rolling guys around and getting some bars and halves and things that, you know, I've been struggling to kind of how I can relate, how I was able to turn guys in, in college and translate that into freestyle. But I think I'm starting to figure out some ways to convert some turns. And I think, in the last couple of years, I've gotten two takedowns almost in every single match I've wrestled internationally. So if uh, if I can convert just one of those two takedowns into a turn, it's going to put me in a much better position moving forward. So that's been a kind of a primary focus and um, getting some confidence against high level competition. In those turning positions is something that will be uh, with the pace that I can wrestle. If I can just convert one of those takedowns into turns, it will you know put me in a better situation. So that's the you know, overall. I'd say that's kind of when I look back on Uregan, you know, obviously excited for the opportunity. Got to wrestle great competition every single match, which is awesome. Got to challenge myself, challenge my conditioning, and uh, you know where I'm at from a training perspective, and um, was able to implement some good techniques. So it was a good start to the year, and I'm just hungry to get back on the mat. I think you got a fall in the semis there with a, a bar and a wrist, maybe, or maybe a bar and a half. I can't remember which it was, but uh, how much do you feel like that confuses? Uh, foreign wrestlers when you get into some of those folk style positions on top? I just think it's a unique feel that you know, I had in college where I was able to get a lot of turns um, on guys and I've had a lot of confidence in that position. I mean, I've been, you know, doing bars and halves and things like that since I was 10 years old. So if I can, it's a good feel for me. When I get in those positions, I feel comfortable and my instincts really kick in. And I think in freestyle, it's it's hard to capitalize on those positions. So I'm a takedown those guys are you know, for an collegiate, they're always building up, right? So I, I was on, always comfortable learning how to turn guys, they build up. In freestyle, you know, you get taken down, you're going flat. So, you know, I was able to capitalize on a, off the takedown, get the arm bar on the semis, and in the finals, um, just in, in, in a kind of a scramble position, I was able to kind of get the guy's hips up in the air and roll them around and, um, you know, kind of end up in a similar position. So yeah, I think that's what your instincts take in. We've been doing this for sport for a really long time. And uh, anytime you can get in a position that you feel really comfortable in, good things are typically going to happen. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, right now just, you know, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it, it's a confusing thing. I think they're used to gut wrenches and leg laces. So, you know, if any, any time that we can get opportunity to change it up, you know, it's only going to, I think, be in, be in our benefit and use our background if we get those opportunities to do so. Do you like the new Final X format? I think the new format, um, you know, with the, you know, the having a best two out of three in the world team trials and a best two out of three uh, in the final X, you know, I think it's it's gonna probably pick the best guy. You know, it just does a lot of matches to kind of average out, you know, who the best person's gonna be to represent the country. So I think, um, you know, not having to go through uh, the mini tournament and wrestle, you know, a world medal caliber guy, you know, some in a lot of instances the best guy in the world. Um, at the end of that day in a best two out of three matches, I, you know, it'd be difficult, you know, rarely, I, you know, if you had to wrestle three or four matches and wrestle a guy of that caliber that sits out the finals to wrestle them best two out of three, I mean, it's a disadvantage for sure. Um, and it, but that formula has worked really well for us as a country. So I think that this is kind of a, a modification of that. Um, you know, obviously to win a world Olympic championship, you have to be able to win four or five matches um, in a row. Um, you know, but right now moving to the two-day format, you know, where you're going to wrestle through the quarterfinals or semis and the finals the next day, and having two-day weigh-ins, I think this format um, 
just kind of reflects that. So I'd say that it's a good good way of the United States kind of changing our how we make our team to the format that's in the world in Olympics. So I think that moving forward, if we could, you know, it's a great year to test it out. We have a lot of depth and so in a lot of weight classes. So it's going to be a lot of battle. Um, so to see as a, from a wrestling fan perspective, to see some of these matches, the best two out of three, couple, multiple high level matches, matchups and best two out of threes. And then some more for them in different cities and appeal to those fan bases. I think it'll be really cool. I know, you know I'm excited to have the opportunity to wrestle in state college. Um, you know, I haven't wrestled a dual, I haven't wrestled in state college since my last dual meet as a senior in college, you know? So I think that will you know, having that opportunity down the road will be pretty special. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to it. What's your most memorable match in Carver Hawkeye Arena? My most memorable match. Uh, that's a tough one. I think I, you know, I wrestled here twice in Olympic trials. Um, you know, neither, neither one of those, I would look back and be thrilled with my performances. So I wouldn't probably say it was those ones in college. I wrestled here a couple of times. Um, I think I had a tech fall in Carver Hawkeye Arena uh, one time in a dual meet that was pretty close. That kind of swung us back in into our direction, which I think was uh, was pretty good. But I mean, just honestly, I'd say the experience is just when you, any time the sport of wrestling, you can walk out in front of that many enthusiastic fans. That's a great experience. Whether it's whether they're for you or against you, I mean, that's just it's cool. So I'd say really just any dual meets that I wrestled here in, in Carver Hawkeye. You know, they were always battles and, you know, just how loud and electric those guys get is uh, pretty good. Do you watch wrestling movies? Do you watch Foxcatcher and some of the movies that have been out recently? And, and what do you think about them if you have? Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I've watched probably every wrestling movie, I would imagine, over time. So I think, you know, get, being able to be exposed to a bigger market is pretty great for us uh, from a wrestling standpoint for the most of the time. And um, I think wrestling is a hard sport to portray to the average person because you now I believe, I truly believe I was talking to Jordan Burroughs yesterday and I really believe that wrestling is the hardest sport in the world. I mean, it's just for what you have to do. And when you think about six minutes, it doesn't sound that hard, but I mean, you can be so exhausted in six minutes. You can train for years, you know, and just maybe your warm up isn't quite right or you overwarmed up or you, there could be so many factors that go into it that could affect your performance in six minutes. And I mean, if you wrestle a guy that really makes you wrestle hard for six minutes straight and just it could come down to one scramble, one, you know, one little flurry or one thing that could maybe not go your way or it just, there's so many little details, but I mean, it is a very difficult sport. I mean, you're getting clubbed and smacked and pushed and pulled and snapped. I mean, to have that contact and also have to have the speed and agility and endurance to go through that. I think, you know, anytime that, that's a that's tough to portray to somebody, and um, <clears throat> you know, any time that we can get the opportunity to see what it's like to live a life as a wrestler, I think is a good thing. David, thank you for this time. We are excited to see you wrestle at Carver Hawkeye Arena for the World Cup and represent the United States. We've enjoyed watching you. You're one of the the fan favorites, and you always bring a great show. And you certainly embody what entertainment value in the sport is, and and we certainly appreciate that. Well, I appreciate. It. Thanks for having me on. All right, that was David Taylor. For David Taylor and Andy Hamilton, I'm Kyle Klingman. You've been listening to On the Mat. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.